in Rwanda today for a very interesting conversation we're going to have. But before we start, um, I want to remind everybody two things. One, we are on the record. And second is we have too many people. Uh, I see we have 410 people. So we cannot take all the questions. And so we take one question from the public because too many questions. And we we'll try, I try to ask as many questions as possible to the ambassador and I hope uh, it will be the same question. Uh, you guys joining us today will have love to ask the ambassador. But we don't take it long. Ambassador, thank you again for, for joining us today. And we're very glad to have you. Uh, maybe we'll split, I will start our conversation a little bit with uh, the Tokyo International Conference on African Development. Uh, you hosted the last one was 2019 and you have a uh, one in 2022 in Tunisia, if I'm not wrong, and I think it's the first time uh, it will be in Africa. Could you take us a little bit of uh, the history about of the, you know, the, the Tokyo International Conference on Africa and what are the goals for this conference? Okay, thank you very much for having me uh, this evening. Uh, as you know very well, TICA stands for Tokyo International Conference on African Development. Mm. Uh, the government of Japan has been <clears throat> uh, taking the leadership of the conference since 1993, co-hosted by U United Nations, UNDP, World Bank, and uh, uh, African Union Com Commission. We have been uh, intending to promote high-level dialogues uh, with African leaders uh, to demonstrate our long-term commitment in African countries to fostering peace and stability of the African continent through collaborative partnership. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, as was the case with uh, the previous TICAT 7, which was held in Yokohama, Japan in 2019, most probably next to TICAT 8, which will be held in Tunisia next year, will also focus on uh, intensifying uh, further more economic cooperation between Japan and African countries, including, of course, Rwanda, while uh, trying to share the views of uh, uh, Japan, uh, Japanese diplomacy, which is uh, free and open in the Pacific. Uh, you know that uh, this region is, uh, uh, the weight of this region is 50% of uh, global GDP. And uh, even for African countries, uh, not facing sea like in Rwanda, free and open uh, transportation of people and uh, commodity movement of commodity and uh, people in this ocean is crucial. So, uh, perhaps we will talk about this uh, uh, credo or measured policy of, uh, of Japan to share to be shared with African leaders. Uh, we are about to start detailed discussion uh, on the agenda and protocol uh, of the coming meeting. Mm -hmm. uh, this will be the second time that. Uh, conference will take place in African continent after Nairobi, Kenya. Mm -hmm. And I hope uh, this discussion uh, next year will be uh, strengthening uh, uh, the ties between African countries and Japan. Excellent. Um, I can't wait to have a conversation with that uh, next year when uh, the summit is taking place. It's very fascinating. I didn't know actually it's the second time taking part in Africa, which is important, shows the important um, partnership between Japan and Africa. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Olympics, which is very exciting. Um, the Olympics are taking place in Tokyo, and I'd love to learn a little bit how's the preparation going and you know, what's the atmosphere is going to be, what's going to be like in, in Olympics in, in COVID time. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> yes, uh, Olympic Games and Paralympic Games uh, will be held from July. Uh, uh, and Paralympic Games uh, about one month later uh, in Tokyo. 
Uh, it will be the second time that Japan will host the Summer Games uh, since 1964. And uh, despite all the daunting issues uh, uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic, uh, which all, all over the countries, all the countries in the world is, uh, are suffering from, uh, preparations are underway in good shape and on schedule. Uh, very unfortunately, however, last week a decision was made among uh, uh, I IOC, IPC, Government of Japan, yeah. Prefecture of Tokyo, and uh, uh, Organizing Committee not to accept uh, foreign spectators, uh, except for dignitaries. It is a pity that uh, we will not be able to celebrate this event of solidarity and peace together with all the spectators, uh, foreign spectators. But at least it is a, a great compromise, um, a prudent compromise, I think, uh, in order to ensure the security and the safe games. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm, I hope and I'm sure but anyway, we will be able to find ways to share the uh, joy, emotion, and excitement of games, even without the uh, foreign spectators. Yeah. Uh, I wish uh, also that uh, this will be an unprecedented uh, event, uh, yeah. because it will be held uh, uh, amidst the you know COVID nineteen uh, pandemic, but uh, uh, I hope the Olympic and Paralympic Games uh, will demonstrate to the world the wisdom, the strength, and uh, solidarity of all the human beings mm -hmm. in fight against the COVID nineteen pandemic. Indeed, indeed, it will be very interesting to see. Um, uh, Games taking place. Uh, so maybe let's come back a little bit um, home to Russia between Rwanda and Japan. And I, I just want to point out that exactly a month ago it was the Emperor's birthday. And I would love to little bit to understand what are the key areas of cooperation between Rwanda and Japan? Okay, thank you. Thank you for your question. Uh, so two countries have been enjoying excellent relations for long. Uh, Japan considering Rwanda as a key country uh, to ensure the stability and the peace of the Great Lakes region and uh, immensely appreciating uh, the leadership of His Excellency President Kagame in bringing the country into uh, amazing uh, economic growth over the last past two decades. Uh, Japan has uh, mobilized the fund of approximately US dollars, 700 million in the past uh, so far in different forms of development cooperation in various industrial sectors. Uh, as for private business, uh, the number of Japanese uh, private business, uh, private companies uh, has increased up to 30 as of uh, end of last year. Uh, Looking at the uh, cultural like, relationship between two countries, I'd like to uh, mention that uh, we've been promoting karate sports over the past years. And our embassy holds last year its uh, competition uh, for, of uh, amb so called Ambassador's Cup in Kigali. Uh, also, I want to mention. Uh, in this regard, as this is also our great pleasure that uh, Mr. Theodore Wai, President of Rwanda Karate Federation, will be given uh, an order or a medal from the Emperor of Japan. Mm -hmm. uh, respects to his long lasting uh, devotion to promote karate in Rwanda. Uh, the declaration ceremony will be taking place anytime soon. Mm -hmm. uh, another highlight of bilateral uh, cultural uh, exchange 
with the uh, uh, accommodations of a number of Rwandan students in the past by Japanese universities. Uh, as of now, 56 students, Rwandan students, have been sent to Japan and uh, they have studied in universities in Japan. You are asking me my priorities. Uh, uh, my, uh, for, for my remaining days as ambassador, uh, I think priorities will be uh, put on two, two sectors. Uh, because uh, uh, we are about to enter into the second generation of presence in Rwanda, because this year is the 11th year after we, are, we have opened the embassy here. Our first priority will be, of course, uh, continued support in development cooperation in short term, especially because the countries, like many other countries in the world, uh, struggling uh, against the economic regression because of the pandemic. But most importantly, uh, more, more uh, in mid-term or long-term, I'd like to concentrate my efforts into our introduction of Japanese private investments in, into Rwanda. Yes. I believe that it's a very important, for, important uh, effort for Rwanda to uh, activate private sectors and uh, to alleviate the dependence on government budget uh, for, from the economic viewpoint of this, this country and to boost up the country, uh, country's economic standing uh, in the world. Rwanda is a very well prepared playground for Japanese investors. And the Embassy of Japan is wishing to uh, play an uh, incubator role in this regard. This is my uh, priority, personally. It's, 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 it's fantastic. And, and I, think, I think seeing a, a more private sector playing role is amazing. Um, I, maybe let's come back, Ambassador, on the current pandemic crisis. Um, with COVID, we would love to learn how is the Embassy of Japan support with regards to COVID and in Rwanda or Africa or globally? Uh, I'm not in a position to talk about other African countries, but as far as uh, Japanese support uh, to Rwanda uh, is concerned, I can say that uh, uh, supports from Japan, including uh, those based on G2G basis mm. uh, through JICA, and uh, through international organizations uh, like uh, uh, UNDP, uh, UNICEF, and the UN Women, amount uh, approximately uh, uh, to 800 million yen, consisting of supply of medical and other material and, uh, equipments, and also technological transfer for the local production of PPE in Rwanda. And I, I think uh, this is my uh, 13th month <laughs> since my arrival in Kigali. And uh, in the fourth month, namely in May, and March, or April, <laughs> uh, I, I had the outbreak of pandemic. That's uh, consistently and uh, uh, without any exaggeration or uh, flattering, I've been feeling relatively comfortable, feeling secured by uh, measures taken by the government. And I think the feeling should be shared by all other uh, Japanese residents, I think. Yeah. Because, uh, uh, there are two things uh, which are important uh, in this kind of situation, I think, in my opinion. Uh, one is the leadership and quick decision and smooth execution by the government uh, or countermeasures. But also, more importantly, uh, people's understanding and collaboration. And th these two uh, elements uh, common 
commonly existing in two countries, I think, both in Rwanda and Japan. Japan is also suffering also uh, of the disease. And uh, we have just finished the second, second lockdown in, Japan, in some uh, metropolitan uh, prefectures. Uh, four, four prefectures uh, surrounding Tokyo, including Tokyo. But just lockdown, lockdowns in Japan are not lockdowns like in Europe or in Rwanda. It's a strong recommendation not to do this, not to do that, etc., etc. Uh, but uh, so far, uh, I'm not so much optimistic. But so far, uh, the situation uh, is more or less controlled. Mm -hmm. And I think the situation is very similar uh, in Rwanda as well. So uh, this is what I can say about COVID. Yeah, um, I want to ask the last questions because we are running out of time and I will take one question from the public. Uh, my, my, the one I want to ask, looking at what Rwanda has achieved in the last 27 years, 26 years, what lesson do you think the world can learn from Rwanda? Uh, <clears throat> you know, uh, what is most important for, for the life of human being is the uh, economic stability and the stable life um, of every layer of people. I think this is universal even historically speaking. So uh, there should be differences in many aspects in every country, uh, differences of religion or difference of belief or difference of uh, profession, difference of gender, difference of you know, each history of each family, etc., etc. But uh, when when the country can achieve a stable economic uh, situation, uh, any country can can you know uh, uh, enjoy a stable life. And that's what we can learn mm -hmm. from Rwanda. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and the last question is: What lesson the world, especially African countries, can learn from uh, Japan? Uh, you know, there is a big difference between Rwanda and Japan. Uh, Japan is surrounded by the sea, mm. while Rwanda is not. But uh, we have many similarities and uh, same, how can I say, people's state of mind are quite similar. Uh, we are both reserved, humble, and uh, prudent. Uh, I couldn't be so so arrogant to say that Rwanda, Rwanda should learn this and that from Japan. But the uh, most important thing to, to the growth of the country, to the growth of the economy, is the uh, individual, you know, education, you know, uh, aspiration yeah. to to look for the better life and uh, you know, harmonization among people, uh, understanding each other. So that's why I think Japan could, could achieve uh, economic growth after the devastating Second World War second, and uh, based on the past experience before the war, we try to restore the country once again, and we could uh, more or less succeed. And uh, <clears throat> although uh, uh, your country is not facing the sea, so that means there, there should be some physical, geographical difficulties for the growth of the country, economic growth of the country. Uh, when people are well educated and motivated, aspiring for a better life and better future of the country by, by the forced strength of brain 
I think uh, uh, your country can can grow more and uh, becoming as uh, one of the center corners of African continent. Excellent, wonderful, uh, Ambassador. Thank you very much. Uh, maybe let's take one question from the public. <laughs> there are so many questions. I see we have. Um, 52 questions, so we can't take all the questions. I'm going to ask one question I saw that came first is, Ambassador, this is from Dr. Munezero from the University of Rwanda, and his question is, uh, what's the secret of Japan innovation success? Uh, <clears throat> very, very difficult question to answer, but uh, I, I think, uh, in my personal opinion, again, without becoming arrogant for ourselves, I think the uh, supremacy or excellence of Japanese uh, success mm. is not only for the hardware of things, uh, you know, I don't, I, I don't say that uh, everybody can produce anything, but uh, you know, uh, there are not so many difficult, delicate things to, to produce, you know, apart from some, some exceptions. Uh, but the important thing is good execution yes. after sales of products, you know. Uh, it's easy to sell, sell good products. It's not so easy to mobilize, to use, to control and manage the execution of operation using that product. Yeah. When when you when you come to Tokyo, and when you uh, watch how many trains are running, how many subways are running per minute, or per five minutes, or per ten minutes. Uh, you cannot imagine how all these things can be controlled. This is not a question of hardware. Trains are good trains. Subways are good subways. But uh, there is a system and uh, expertise yeah. to manage timely uh, operation of trains without any accident. Yeah. So this is very important, I think. Excellent. That's, that's one of, I think that's a very important lesson to learn. Implementation is very important uh, some, uh, many times. Uh, Your Excellence, thank you very, very much for your time. It is so good to have you with us today. And I hope after COVID, we will have a conversation in person with a group of people. Uh, we won't have all these 400 people. We'll have a small conversation. Uh, and I want to say thank you very much for your time. And, uh, and wish all you the best the remainder of your time as an ambassador. Have a wonderful evening, Ambassador. Thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Thank you.